And that's all from me. So, so did anyone see themselves in that video? Because I saw at least one person turn around and go, that's me, that's me. <laughs> so it's just a one-point skydive. And everyone's heard that before, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. OK, let's have a show of hands. How many of you here have been on a uh, big way skydive before? Head up or head down? There's quite a few. So you, maybe you guys should be up here, not me. <laughs> uh, when people first start thinking about um, doing a big way skydive or maybe trying out for a record, there's usually one thing they think of, and that's this. It's the grip. It's that one point. And thinking about the grip and focusing on it from the moment you exit the aeroplane is the main reason for lots and lots of problems from overfloating, from hitting the formation, um, to hard docking. But maybe most surprisingly, it's the main reason people can't get the grip. The amount of times I've seen people just like flying there, they're staring at the grip, they're thinking, I've done this hundreds of times before in a tunnel, why can't I get it? It's like there's an invisible force field between them and the grip. And the reason is because they're thinking the wrong thing. So what we're going to talk about today is what you should be thinking about through every stage of the skydive, from the dirt dive to the climb to altitude, from the exit to the approach to the formation. Uh, we are going to talk about the grip. We're not going to focus on it too much, but we're, we're also going to talk about the safety aspects of the break-off, uh, the canopy ride, and even in the landing area, because as we all know, the skydive's not over till we're safely back in the packing shed. But before we do that, we're going to have a look at the engineering behind a typical uh, head, head down big way skydive using some amazing PowerPoint graphics, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? That took me hours. OK, so here we have a six-way base. This is what it should look like when it comes out of the plane. It doesn't always look like this. Sometimes it sort of spins around a little bit. Sometimes it breaks and rebuilds. Sometimes one person flies off, decides to go around the sky a bit and come back again. But eventually, this is what it should look like. And to be honest, these days, it's usually on heading. So it's usually that way up. If you, a lot of people try not to get put in the base. You hear a lot of, oh, I don't want to be stuck in the base. But really, especially if you're a bigger guy, in the base is a good place to be. Um, on a big way camp, Quite often, I'll put myself forward to go in the base and quite early in the camp. One, because it gets it over with, and two, because if you don't know the organisers too well, and if you know you can fly a, a, the base well, don't do it if you can't, uh, you can, uh, it, it puts you right under their nose and you can show them that you can do a good job, and then they'll notice you later on when you're doing the other stuff. The best advice, the biggest problem the base usually gets is breaking as it comes out the door, or, or spinning and breaking. And usually it's because when people exit, they tend to let their head go in and their legs get back behind them. This puts hair on their back. It causes it to drive in and to spin. And once it starts spinning, there's no stopping it because the, the centrifugal force just pushes everyone out onto their back. So the best advice I can give you if you're in the base is on the exit, when you get out, get into the airflow, grips low, hips in and head back. And just keep that thought. It's like hips in, head back all the time. And that's whether it's a... Uh, just a three-way round that you're launching or, or an eight-way round, or if it's a sky van or a side exit plane, it's always the same thing. Head back, hips in. Once you're out and flying, it's got to go as fast as, it, as, as you can, but the thinking on the base has changed a lot lately. It used to be everyone used to fly with low grips because it's uh, aerodynamic and fast. The trouble is with low grips is it's very floppy, and when people dock on it, it can push the base in. So to keep the base solid, People are now flying with their arms out here. And to compensate for that, to keep the speed up, it's like nice, narrow, but strong legs. So people aren't flying like this in the base anymore, apart from maybe some pretty big guys. So, uh, and again, it's everybody's keeping their head back to keep the pressure outwards. And hopefully, it'll then look nice and round like this. Next on are the first stingers. Um, it's usually assumed that these are the ninjas of the of the uh, of the formation, because they've got to be there fast. I'm not sure that I totally agree with that, because yes, the first stingers do get on fast, but they usually get out next to the base. The second stingers, however, usually have much further to fly. So they usually get out, you know, the, the, after the first stingers get on, there's usually a few seconds to wait till the second stingers get there. 
However, when the first stinger slot really comes into its own is uh, when the rest of the formation starts to build. When the formation starts to build, all that tension comes through onto the base, and it's the job of the first stingers to stop it from getting on there. I mean, Mikey Carpenter in the Euro record, where there was some quite messy jumps, did a fantastic job of just holding on and keeping the pressure off and keeping the pressure off until the point that he knew the base couldn't take it anymore and then released the grip. Um, so I think that really shows how, where the skill of the first stinger comes in. Next on is the second stinger. I personally think that this is a much harder job because the first stingers might not be presenting as still and effectively as they could. So when the second stinger comes in, they're going to pick up the grip, they're not going to look at it, they're going to be cross-referencing the formation. But these grips tend to move a little bit. If you look at it, you'll never get it, which goes back to what I was saying before. So make sure you're cross-referencing, uh, you're looking at your cross-partner, we're going to talk a lot more about that later. Don't look at the grip, pick it up. And the main thing with the presentation is a lot of second stingers present out behind them like this. And that makes the job really hard for the pod closers because the pod closer wants to come in and pick up the grips right in front of them and then pop it out. If the second stingers aren't presenting into the middle, um, like we were showing before, then the pod closer's got to go all the way over here, get this one, drag it back all the way over there, and then drag it back and then get, onto his, um, get back onto his radial and cross-reference. Now this slot, I'm not sure what they're called. In the world record, we call them boogers, but I'm not, not really sure what the technical term is. But really, it's like a stinger between the first and se second stinger. And they're kind of like the first stingers of lines if you're going to build lines. I reckon that this is the hardest slot on the formation. It's certainly the one that I dread getting the most. Right in this area here, you get a lot of leg traffic, a lot of burble. And if these pod closers aren't doing their job keeping the pods in line, then these can start to close in and you're, you're stealing those guys' space. You're really, really closing them out. What makes it even worse is if it's a bigger formation, say with an eight-way base, you're then going to have four pods, so they've got less room to start with. So it's even more important that the pod closers keep on their radials because that's what keeps the formation nice and symmetrical and in line. So once these guys are on, we can have a line closer. They've got exactly the same job as a pod closer but just closing the lines. Once these guys are on, then the formation suddenly solidifies. We've got here a really nice 30-way. This is, you know, it's nice and round, it's nice and spaced out. And it, because it's one unit now, it tends to stop moving and start settling down. So it's a really good platform to sort of build off of and make a bigger formation. We're not going to keep going on like this forever until we've got a 100-way up there. So <laughs> we put one more set of, uh, we put one more set of stingers on. And there we've got a nice 36-way formation. When I designed this, I had no intention of doing it, but then I sat down and looked at it and thought, prepare to be amazed here, by the way, with the uh, PowerPoint animation. And I thought, you know what that reminds me of? If we put one more sti uh, stinger on there and turned it round a bit... Ah. Look at that, eh? Took me hours. <laughs> so... And that is, was basically the UK record. So, and there you can see the formation. So we've got the two stingers at the bottom there. Well, we're, if we start in the middle, we've got the base here. Is everyone saying, that's me, that's me? We've got the base. <laughs> yeah, Ali Milne, I think, is right here. Is that Ali Milne? No, that's Mike McNaughton. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 well, you fly very similarly. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> here's the base, and then here's your, the one pod, another pod, and another pod there. Uh, there's the lines, and then here's the extra stinger on the outside. So that was a 37 way we did last September. Okay, now the PowerPoint animation is going to get really out of hand. This is going to blow your minds. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We need more of that for the animation. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> we haven't even started it yet. This is great. So 
<laughs> what we're going to start looking at now is your flight plan, because we said before, you, you, you can't be thinking about the grip from the moment you leave, leave the aeroplane. And it's the most common fault that I see on all the big way camps we do and everything else. People get out of the plane and what they're looking for is a base or their slot. And it's not what your job is. Uh, the order, your flight plan is, anyone know what it is? Level, slot, dock. So everyone's heard it before if you've been on a big way camp. You're going to hear it loads and loads of time. And every time I go on a big way camp, I kind of forget that. And the first couple of jumps, I'm always a bit rusty and don't quite get it right. But it's so important. And that's why it's worth harping on about a little bit. So your first job when you get out the plane is to get onto level. It's not to go towards the base. So if only there was a drum roll. Here are three Cessna caravans. OK, so we've got our floaters here, our base here, and our divers here. I'll just uh, move them up into the middle of the screen a bit. <laughs> OK, and what you'll notice is when we say on level, they're not actually on level. You've got this nice concave, convex, whatever shape going on. And the other thing you'll notice is that the first person out of the plane hasn't moved towards the base. He's actually still in order. If he'd have moved towards the base, one, it would be difficult for him to get across to there, and two, he would be arriving out of sequence. So realistically, you want to have everybody in order so that you all approach the formation in the right order. What's more, when you start to drive, you're going to get lift. So when this guy starts to drive in, it's going to give him lift up towards the formation. If he was sitting up here somewhere, then when he starts to drive in, he's going to struggle to get down and get onto level. Um, that, another couple of things to notice off of, this, uh, off of this slide is if you're out here, if you dive down out here, if you were to do something wrong, let's say you go like plummeting past the formation at 200 miles an hour, you're not going to get busted for it. So maybe I shouldn't say that here, but <laughs> you know, it's true. If you, if you do anything here, if you come through the formation here, it's going to be on video. There's like 100 or so GoPros out there and the chances are you're going to get cut. So it really is worth making sure you come down onto level. Uh, sorry, the divers are actually over here, but you know what I mean. So divers come down onto level on this side, the floaters come up onto level on this side. This is what it could, might look like from the top. Um, this is what it should look like in the sky. In truth, I've never seen a skydiver that looks anything like that orderly whatsoever. There's usually people all over the place. However, these people that are nearest, and this is how it could be, there's lots of ways that you can, that you can uh, design a jump, but usually the people nearest the base are obviously going to be the first stingers, and these first floaters and the last diver, um, they're going to be your, your pod closers and your whackers. Uh, the really nice thing about this slide is that it's a really good uh, way to get onto our next subject, which is a dirt dive, and it's something that's way, way overrated because... When, you're, when you turn up at these camps, you've got yourself a slot. The dirt dive is your only chance to get an idea of what you're likely to see when you get out of the plane. And if you've got an idea of what you're expecting to see, then that's going to work really well for you. So where a lot of people go wrong on a dirt dive is they'll just stand next to the formation and they'll stand roughly where they expect to be and they'll just pick their grip up and quite often they'll be chatting to their mates or you know, they just won't really be paying too much attention. They'll just look at the colour of the suit of the guy they're docking on, maybe get another reference in the base. However, it's really, really important to know, if we go back to this slide, to stand in your exit frame, to stand where you expect to be when you come onto level. That, for me, that's where the dirt dive starts. I mean, sure, you all do the aeroplane stuff and get out the aeroplanes. Um, uh, but once you're out of the aeroplane, uh, your, your first job is to get onto level, and that's where the dirt dive starts. So if you're, if, if you're this guy here, and your slot happens to be around here somewhere on the outside of the formation, then really you want to think about who you're going to be following up, what you're going to see on the base, what you're going to see if you go too far, and you really want to take the time to pick out those references um, and the references that are likely to be there. I tend to choose people who I know are going to be there and who have also got 
sort of quite bright suits. I never use the streamers as a reference, apart from as a backup reference, because I would say on probably a quarter of the jumps I go on where they use streamers, the, the streamer has some sort of malfunction. So the streamers in the base, I kind of tend to ignore. After the dirt dive, uh, it's time to get on the plane. And during the climb to altitude, everyone has their own rituals. Some people like listen to music, some people read books. I personally like to just sit there quietly. I visualize at least three times on the way up. I visualize once after you take off, once halfway up, and once as we reach altitude. So it's all nice and fresh in my mind. Um, most big ways, if it's a record, we'll use oxygen. If you're going above 15,000 feet, or even lower than that in some countries. But most record jumps are 18, 19,000 feet, and you'll need oxygen. I'm not going to go too much into that, because if there's oxygen being used, there will be an oxygen brief. But what I will say is, in, in, I've been doing big ways now for about five or six years, and I've never seen a problem or a serious problem with hypoxia until this last year. In 2015, I saw a whole plane on a 164-way formation. A whole plane got hypoxic, and everyone got out, and none of them arrived on the formation. They were all OK. They all, all their canopies deployed, and they got down. But none of them remembered the skydive. None of them remembered being in free fall. Like they all only remembered being under canopy. We had a similar situation in Empuria when we tried to do a higher altitude jump than that, um, where a lot of people on there didn't remember being in free fall and just came around under canopy. Also in our plane on the world record, there was a girl on the plane who had the oxygen tube in her mouth and she was, well, I assume she was breathing or she would have died, but <laughs> she appeared to be breathing okay. And slowly her lips went blue, then she started tearing everyone else's oxygen tubes out of their mouths and um, you know, she was a gibbering wreck basically. So we pinned her down, shoved loads of oxygen tubes in her mouth and eventually we got her back. Um, and again, the scary thing is about it, she did really, really well on the skydive, but she can't remember anything about that on the plane. So hypoxia is so insidious. So from a safety point of view, I would say keep a check on yourself, but there's no point because you don't know when you, you know, if you're getting hypoxic, you don't know it. So what's more important than keeping a check on yourself is keeping a check on everyone that's around you. And after that, in the, the world record, we actually all got buddied up with people like divers do. So you know, just making sure that everyone's all right as we got to altitude. OK, we're going to see a few record, uh, videos now. Um, some of it might be incriminating one or two people in this room. So I'm sorry for that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a diving exit. So what we really want to look at on here is the jumper on this video does quite a good job of getting out the plane really fast, diving down onto level, moving into the formation, and picking up the dock. And if you notice as well, it is one of those docks between the first and second stinger. So. The first part of, the, of the, any skydive, I usually find is quite um, yeah, it's a good time to check your breathing, check that you're chilled out. There's not a lot going on. Also, now this, uh, the jumper's on level, but I don't know if you notice the sandbar there. If you ever jump at Sebastian, watch that because it catches you out on the levels. So really nice job of getting onto level first, slowly coming into the formation. Um, and you can see here a lot of good levels going on. Everyone's looking over the top. There's a lot of low grips. Um, so there's a, a really nice formation. Here's another diving exit. <coughs> now on this one, if you notice on the last one, the base went out of the frame. On this one, the base doesn't because the jumper's looking at the base and he's flying towards the base. And that's all he's thinking about now is his slot and his grip and can he get it. And OK, so what tends to happen when you come down at an angle like that on your back towards a base, you're not in a good position to stop. You can't stall back. So, and, and that's something that's quite common. So again, if you come down on the outside, if you overdive a little bit, like happened then, it's not a big deal. 
But if you do it next to the base, you're going to be close to all the floaters. And we just we did see then how close that was. If we just have another look. I can't say. I think I think it was Adam Dare actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Okay, floating exit. Uh, I think that's Doc Carter there. Okay, the first thing I always look at is the plane that you just got out of, because if it's a big formation, the other planes will come into view, and then every, all of a sudden everything will make sense. If you start looking for the base straight away, then it can get a little bit disorientating. So again, float up onto level. On no account, let the base overtake it, take you. Make it your absolute 100% uh, rule that the, that the base is never going to overtake you. And the thing is, when it starts getting that momentum, you can't get the acceleration to get past it. It's better, if you're floating, if this is a base, it's better to level up to be going the same direction and the same speed as a base underneath and slow, and slow down and let it come to you than it is to try and get to it super fast and then end up going past it, or to go be too late and the base overtakes you. There's a, a couple of, I couldn't actually find this, uh, there's been some really bad examples of overfloating, but I found this video, and you can see this one guy here who overfloats too, uh, too fast and just wigs out. Luckily, there was no divers. But there's another type of overfloating. When you've been on level, and you actually drive in as just as the base is coming off the hill. And this is also really common. And the feeling that you get is that you actually, that the base and everything's coming towards you and you go through everyone. And you can see this person at the back is having trouble stopping. Luckily, they're far enough out. But what you'll notice is that rather than trying to stop by stalling back, which Ali Milne can teach you to do in the tunnel, um, <laughs> but then that way you always know what's going to do that again. OK. Um, but what they've actually done is more of a switch carve. So they're going this way, realise they're going too fast, and then they've turned round to put the brakes on. So then they can't see where they're going. And uh, keep that in mind. Sometimes when you're in a trail plane, you don't know if you're going to be diving or floating. You, you're in that middle ground. Or sometimes you expect to be diving or floating, and the base can be early or late, or the super floater might not go, and, it, and that can cause uh, issues in timing. On this jump, everyone was expecting the base to be down there. So we're all looking down, and at the same point, everyone goes, uh, uh, what's going on? And then everyone looks back up. So, and there's the base. But one thing that I've noticed in these situations is particularly if the base if you get out and you're supposed to be floating and you look up at the lead plane and there's nobody there and it, 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 you're just looking at an empty or it looks like an empty plane and you're not sure if they've gone or not, sometimes there'll be one or two people in the sky and you can tell by their body positions whether the base has gone or not. If they're in a vertical position and diving down, then obviously you know the base is already gone. If they're floating up, then you know that the base is still going to come out of the plane. Usually on multi-plane uh, formations, the base is the first thing out anyway. So if you see people that aren't in the base, you know that you've got to start diving. But a really good method I learned, and I think it's because from being, a, doing, uh, from being a pilot, when you learn to fly, they teach you not to look at the instruments because you're too focused in on everything. They teach you to look out the window and use the horizon. And as soon as you start doing that, as soon as you start using the horizon, all of a sudden flying becomes easy and it usually takes quite a few hours of flying till you learn to do that. And it's the same with skydiving. I mean, you've got this massive instrument here and it goes all, the way, you know, it's all around you. So if you can start using that, it, all of a sudden everything gets so easy. So here you can see that the horizon is not where it should be because if you're on level, the horizon's going to be here. Uh, ideally, there's going to be just a little bit of sky between the top of everyone's helmets and where you are. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work in the UK, because I can remember some UK record jumps where we went through the middle of a thunderstorm and there wasn't much of a horizon at all. <laughs> so this is what it looks like to be off level in what's kind of like a lot of people's comfort zone. It's really a kind of danger zone or a getting cut zone. 
but it's, uh, you can see there's a lot of people in this, on this picture who are just not quite on level in that comfort zone. And they really need to just get down and get, uh, and get that bit of a uh, sky between the top of the helmets and the horizon and the ground. And all of a sudden, everything's going to get much easier. So that's what it looks like when you're on level from the camera person's perspective. Um, and although this guy, I'm not even sure who that is. Anyone want to own up? No? OK. Uh, but he's not actually in a bad place because he's just slightly lower than the formation. So he looks to be off level, but that's actually a good place to be. And this is someone in, sitting in the comfort zone. Another thing that commonly happens on bigger ways, and I found if you've got a, a, a slot that's on the east side of the formation, which I always seem to get, um, particularly, um, uh, yeah, no, if it's, it's on the east side of the formation, yeah, particularly in the evening, then very often you're going to just lose the base in the sun straight away. And this happens more often than you'd think. So this, this is actually my video, and it didn't look any better than it does on this video. That's what I could see. And so what you don't know, I can see Mike Swanson there. I can see one or two people here. But basically, you don't know if the base is about to come flying out of the sun. And eventually, it'll appear. And there it is. OK, so what's really important about this is not to, when you can't see the base, it's to keep doing what you'd normally do. And don't, uh, you know, don't, whatever you do, don't drive towards it. You really need to make sure that, if anything, you go steeper earlier. And then the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to be a bit further from the formation and a bit lower. But usually, there's lots of time on these things to get in and to, um, to get to your slot. Again, that's a, that's a, a good picture showing what, what it looks like as you get onto level. And when you're on a formation this size, you can really start to see now how there's absolutely no point in looking for your slot when you get out of the plane, because you're not going to see it till you're much closer. There's not even any point trying to work out which way around the formation is. I mean, when I'm standing here and looking at a still photo, I can see the black ribbon and the, the white streamer there. But when I'm jumping, I can't really see that. I can't really see the colors in here. So all you can do from here is then work your way in and I knew that my slot was round to the left just before Ali Milne. So all I had to do is go, is go in and go round and to the left, and your slot is nearly always in where you expect it to be these days. If it's not, you're probably not going to get cut because you're in the right place. It's the base that's, off ang that's, off, that's, um, that's rotated. Um, but apart from uh, the, la the first few jumps of the last Euro record, the base is usually on heading these days. OK, here's another floating exit. OK, nice exit. Looking at the plane, um, you can see the base. And remember what I was saying about not letting the base overtake you and go past the horizon. OK, so we, we've, it's, gone, it's overfloated a little bit and just gone past the comfort zone. And, ooh. What happened there? <laughs> well, that was a premature deployment. And uh, how do we stop that from happening? The most important thing, apart from the obvious stuff, apart from, pretend, apart from um, <laughs> making sure that your gear's in good condition, your closing loop's tight, your closing loop's not worn, you've got to protect your handles in the door, um, whether it's your BOC handle, your reserve handle, or even your cutaway. Chop it! I've, ki <laughs> I've kicked a cutaway out. <laughs> <laughs> is it big? Is it square? <laughs> uh, that was the last time that canopy was ever seen, by the way. <laughs> and we, and th this was also a pull-out rig. And pull-out rigs are, are much more, you know, a lot of Americans use them because they're much more secure than standard BOC deployments. But all, all that we can think of that, that may have happened, because we know the rig is in really good condition, it's a very, very careful, very experienced jumper, is that maybe the BOC got dislodged in the door and then it slowly flapped out and then eventually pulled the pin and then the pilot chute came out. So I don't know about you, but when I was watching that video, I saw a few broken lines and things like that. And 
I mean, a head down deployment is going to be pretty uncomfortable, but I don't know if it's going to like break lines. So let's have a closer look and see if we can see what happened there. Okay, this is just at the point of the deployment. So the really interesting thing is that the jumper who's, uh, who had the premature deployment had no idea that this guy had gone through his canopy and through his lines at the time. In fact, the guy came up to him in the landing area and said, have you got my GoPro? Because he lost his GoPro. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean have you got your GoPro? Do you know what's just happened to me? So, <laughs> so, the, um, so not only is it for our own safety, it's for all the other jumpers' safety as well. I mean, luckily, both of these jumpers were OK. They were both on the next jump. But you can see from this picture exactly how bad that could have been. Go, uh, John? <laughs> no. <laughs> last day at the camp as well, that wasn't it? <laughs> it was a lot, yeah. Gary Sweeney. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a lot of talk about what head down positions you should fly on a big way. Um, and I think with the tunnel and the shelf positions coming in, that's like really, really a relevant issue now. And we've been told on quite a lot of the, the record tryouts of big way camps and on a lot of the record attempts, we've actually been told we are not allowed to fly shelf on the formation. In reality, I think you can get away with flying shelf as long as, you are, as, long as you're a very, very strong shelf flyer. Um, so my opinion is, you can fly whatever you like to get to the formation. You can fly a shelf, which if anyone doesn't know is with both your legs hooked back and your arms usually in front of you like that. You can fly a daffy, which is with one leg in front and one behind. Or you can fly pizza like this. <laughs> so, um, and I think shelf's probably the best way or, or just in a kind of tracing uh, position to get to the formation because it's faster, you've got a lot of control as long as you can stall back and don't need to turn around to stop it. But once you're on the formation, if you're flying a shelf, you're usually relying on your, ha on your arms to stop you from uh, go getting forward drive. So once you've got two grips, there's not really a lot stopping you. So it only takes a little bit of burble behind your legs or a little shove on the back and you're out of there. And if, you're, if someone hits you and you're flying shelf, that's going to be a good reason for them to cut you, and you don't want to give them that. If you're flying a daffy, and someone gives you a, a kick on the back, or someone burbles this leg out, you can fly, fly off your front leg. And if you get a push from behind, all you've got to do is kick forward. It's, your leg's already there. So it's a much, much stronger position. And if you're not flying a daffy, and you want to do big way and get on records, it's worth getting in the tunnel. Ali Mill. So, so I'm just uh, promoting you a bit here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and learn to fly. Uh, yeah, learn to fly a good, strong daffy. And if you can, learn to fly both left and right daffy as well. Okay, I didn't need to put the first bit of this on, but I thought the formation looked so nice that it came through the clouds. I thought I'd put that on. Right, if you look over on the left-hand side of the screen as we get nearer to the formation. Here's we've got someone coming in a bit hot. Here's someone else, a bit of out-facing, nice. Just watch here. Whack. OK, let's have a look what happened there. Here's our out-facing golden knight. Our unsuspecting victim. And here's someone that's done what we was talking about before. And there's a shoe. <laughs> so, again, if you're coming in too hot, you've got to stop by stopping. You can't just turn around and try and switch carb and put the brakes on because you can't see where you're going. And that's what's going to happen. And that dude did get cut from that formation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, with the break off, um, from whatever position you're in, your break off is turning away from the centre and flying on your radial away from the centre. It's not a 180. So if you're stung on the formation like this, 
you're going to turn that way and you're going to track that way. If you're a pod closer, if you're leading a pod, then that's the only position when you've got, you've sometimes, not always, sometimes they want you to turn around first. A pod closer is the only person that can start going straight back. Um, and for everyone else, this 180 is so important and it's worth spending time coming on some smaller way camps or, or you know, just doing whatever you can to try and practice it. The, uh, I mean, if you're, once you've, uh, if you're in a base, once you've turned round, if, you, if the pod's breaking off at the same time as you, once you've been in that position, you'll learn to expect people to be behind you. So you know not to just trace straight away. So you want to stop, clear your airspace, and then slowly take the angle and, uh, and then track away. Make sure you track away on your radial and make sure when you do the barrel roll that you don't turn 90 degrees off heading. Like, it, that is another skill that's worth practicing, is staying, a hunt, is staying totally on heading while you do the half barrel roll. I just put this little bit of video on. This is out of Rosanna's edit from the, uh, <laughs> from the Euro record. So there was a little collision there, but the jumper there did a really good job. They're behind now, but they're staying on radio and they're staying with their pod. And if you look at all the other pods, they're all staying together so nicely, and I thought that that little clip of video is such a nice view of what a pod break-off should look like. I'm going to play this whole jump because there's a lot of examples on here of everything with, that we've talked about. And it's also a really, really, um, there's a really interesting break-off on it as well. OK, so after the dive exit, Good time to chill out, take a few breaths, just flying down onto level, nice view of the Bay of Roses. And you can tell that he's thinking the right things because you can't see the base in the camera. As he comes onto level, now he's just stopped in that comfort zone again. See the horizon here? And as with all these other people. So really want to avoid that, but now he's on level. Now watch when he takes the grip you don't even see the grip in the view of the camera. And this was a really nice job as well. And this is what we should be looking for, looking straight through the formation. The grip's really low. You know, it's flying really nice. A few issues with the pod closing. And about now, this pod should be breaking off. And they don't really do a great job in separation there. OK, that was two very good friends of mine, uh, both on sub-100 foot, uh, square foot canopies, uh, cross brace canopies. Um, and it could have been really, really nasty. What actually happened? Well, first of all, in a big way, you need to expect that you're going to open close to other canopies, not necessarily facing towards each other, but often like you open and you know there's someone there and you know there's someone there and you, you know that you've got to open with your hands on your risers, ready to take any... Well, not really evasive action, but more just to steer your canopy one way or the other if you know that someone's around. And I try to always, if I can, aim flying away from the formation still on my radial. If we look at that in slow motion, what we'll actually see is Rosano actually spots this jumper and he's actually taken evasive action, but because his canopy is not fully pressurised, and I think because he's quite amped up to see someone coming straight towards him, he's actually overdone it on the riser and put his own canopy into a spin. So one thing we can learn from that is on every single skydive you do, that you've got an opportunity to learn what your canopy is doing as it's opening and how you can control it through the opening, whether it's through the harness, whether it's through uh, having your hands on the risers, but you, know, you can do a lot to steer your, well, you saw there, you can do too much to steer your canopy. So learn just how to, if you want to turn it 45 degrees one way, how to do that without putting it into a spin, particularly if you're flying a high performance canopy. While we're talking about canopies, um, on the uh, last world record, that was 164 canopies in the sky. And I don't think I saw or heard 
in any of the 13 jumps of any incidences of near misses or canopy traffic issues or anything under canopy. We was told not to, da not to upsize for that. We was actually, uh, in the initial briefing, uh, Rook Nelson said, a lot of people have asked me if they should upsize and they definitely shouldn't. You should fly the canopy that you'd normally fly because most people are on sub 100 foot canopies. So if you're suddenly you know, up flying on a 170 or something, you're going to be like someone driving in the fast lane at 30 miles an hour. So you're going to be a bit of a hazard. So that's not to say you should downsize if, you're, if you jump a 170, but uh, you should learn to fly with the canopy you, that you normally fly. But what was really good about it is everybody joined the pattern and everybody flew the pattern and everybody stuck to the rules. Yeah, there, was a, there was a 90 degree turn restriction. I don't think I really even saw anyone using their front risers. It, you know, the canopy control, it was really crowded. The landing areas were crowded, but everyone done a really good job on sticking to the rules. On a lot of the smaller camps that we've been on, I've seen people trying to sneak in a sneaky 270 or instead of doing 90, doing nearly a 180. And that kind of thing, not only is it irresponsible and it's also setting a bad example to, to other jumpers, but it can also get you cut as well as it can obviously lead to, uh, you know, when you've got all that traffic in the sky, you can end up with a canopy collision or something. So it's really important to stick to whatever rules the organisers have, have laid down. Once you've landed in the landing area, too many people as well just pick up their canopies, high-fiving their mates, and, or just start walking back to the packing shed. But if you, until everyone's landed, you've still got people landing, because even doing 90s, a lot of these canopies are landed at 50 miles an hour. And there has been the occasional ca uh, collision on the ground, and that can be quite nasty as well. So make sure you keep your awareness. Once you've landed, turn around, look at the approach, see what's coming in behind you. And everything we've talked about has been uh, head down so far. Head up formations, they're basically exactly the same until the point that you transition to head up. So that's why it's only a very small part of the, of the seminar. It's um, when you transition to head up, is a, is a, it's quite a new discipline really, so it's a bit of a point for debate. At the Euro record, they wanted us to stay on our heads till we was close to the formation. At the world record, they wanted us to transition as soon as we was on level. If you're a long way out, then they were saying, yeah, you can fly in a little bit on your head, but they didn't want anyone transitioning next to the formation. From what I saw, that, that seemed to work better, but which way it goes, we'll have to wait and see. Here's a, a shot of our first European record, which was an 18-way. This is Gustavo's view, and this is Gary Crisp, who's, a, who's our super floater for the day. Watch his super floating. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, take, take note. Okay, super strong base. And the thing with head up is it accelerates. In head down formations, everyone's trying to go fast all the time. When we're head up, we're trying to uh, slow down as much as we can. So the thing to notice here, some people are transitioned, some people are still on their heads. Uh, transitioning off a level, transitioning back onto the head and... Ooh. Oh, look at this guy here. Yeah. Okay, so most of the people that transitioned early, I thought, got their reasonably quickly, the peop some people are still on their heads, look, and, it's, and now then you're disorientated, then you go underneath me and burble me out. And there it is. It's like the 18 way and it flew for quite a long time. Yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> After that, uh, we then went on to uh, build a 21 way, but unfortunately uh, Gustavo couldn't find a video or something, so I couldn't put that up here today. So, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's it. Uh, thanks to everybody who contributed video and people who agreed for me to put their blunders or whatever up there. The only th other thing I've got left to say is Big Way Skydiving's given me so much. It's, um, you know, with travelling around the world, meeting new people, the views that you, you get to see when you're sort of doing with 164 people diving in, into the sunset. If you haven't done it already, I recommend that you start doing it. And we're going to be running camps at Langer and at Hibblestow later on this year. I think we're starting in April. There's a UK record in September 
Uh, there's some other camps and things going on in Europe and in the States. So, um, yeah, it, it, just look it up. It's all on Facebook and hope to see you at some of those camps. So thanks a lot.